massive thank you as always to our top tier patron Sarah Turner it's not just in your head is hosted by psychotherapist dr harriet frud substance use disorder counselor eco hero and myself the editor and producer liam tate this podcast is entirely funded by listeners and as the famous meme states we are critiquing capitalism because we are forced to participate in it in order to survive so if you can afford to give then your contribution will ensure that we can keep making the show however if you can't, then please just leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. Tell your friends about us and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, or YouTube. Massive thank you as always to L for organizing our monthly reading groups and episode discussions, which you, dear listener, can join in too. Just head over to our Eventbrite page and the link is in the show notes. Yes, dear listener, it's the moment you've been dreading. However... Uh, if we want to keep making this show, then we need cold, hard cash. So if you want an advert for your listening experience, come join our Patreon. Uh, until then, endure this fairly innocuous advert for Spotify. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify, and when you want to take conversations with your friends to the next level, Q&A and polls are the best way to get them talking. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters... Personal statement example, I feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A and polls has let me be creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. Like the landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. We can't have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. This episode is about the various aspects of housing, but not usually in the way that we talk about it. We talk about the lack of affordable housing, but we often don't talk about the quality of housing and how, you know, housing is probably one of the most expensive things that most people will buy if they purchase anything in their property in their life. That's probably going to be the most expensive purchase that they'll make in many ways. And yet there are some serious problems with the way that homes are constructed, its impact on the people, its impact on the environment, et cetera, et cetera. And Dan is here to enlighten us on some of those aspects. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Dan Colbert. I'm a building contractor in Portland, Maine. And I also recently co-authored a book called Pretty Good House, A Guide to Building Better Homes. And we talk about the healthfulness of homes, both for the occupants and the planet. One of the leading kickoffs that I was going to say was that a lot of times if you live in a lot of gentrifying areas, especially near cities, you are seeing like these monstrosities of condo buildings going up that are that have a very particular kind of a modern look that are also apparently extremely horribly constructed in terms of quality. I don't know if you can say that universally, but you can certainly say that paying a lot of money is no guarantee of getting a house that is well built. And I certainly have gone on tours of new condo projects where I shudder and I want to warn the buyers that at the very least they should put a bunch of money aside for the repairs that are going to be needed to the building in the next decade. So yeah, which is a shame because none of this is terribly mysterious. And and the damage can happen quickly. And if it doesn't happen quickly, things like indoor air quality, mold, all of that kind of stuff can happen without being obvious. Yeah, there's that there's that idea, isn't there, the Lindy effect, that if something's been around for a long time, that chances are it will be around for a long time more. And so I guess the danger with a lot of the new builds is that it doesn't have a track record <laughs> of any sort of length of time. So whilst right. they can look maybe attractive for those that have the money to afford them, you yeah, you haven't factored in what happens over 
a decade or two decades or that kind of thing. Exactly. And cost is totally separate from quality, right? Portland, Portland, Maine has had a building boom for a while now, probably 20 years. It doesn't matter, especially during COVID, people were buying houses in Maine sight unseen because they wanted to get out of bigger cities or something, or they just had a lot of money and they wanted to do something. So anyway, they obviously had no idea what they were getting. There's this great follow on Instagram, cheap old houses, where they show these gorgeous old houses in parts of the country that nobody apparently wants to live in. And you can buy these incredible places for under $100,000. Wow. Yeah, there was a thing in Britain a couple of years ago, the Grenfell disaster, basically. It's a block of flats. I'm not sure if you it came across the pond, but yes, yeah, a block of yeah, flats just went up in. Certainly the building in, community. Yeah, it was. it's sad and completely preventable, but... For anyone who doesn't know, it's basically a block of flats in a very posh area of London, but the block of flats wasn't particularly posh. It housed various people who I guess maybe were on lower incomes, and the cladding on the building was highly flammable, and the whole thing just went up in flames and a whole bunch of people died. And then they found out that this cladding, which had got approved, I guess it's sort of government policy, had was on flats all around the country. And loads of people okay. were then stuck in their flats They, because the it's still ongoing, I think. The government hasn't stepped up to pay for the renovations that need to be done. So it's complicated business. Yeah, and it's, and it's uh, right. The model of home ownership just makes it that much more complicated. For most people, if they own a house, that's their single most, that's their single largest source of wealth which has a lot of problems. For one thing, it's a curious form of wealth because it's not very liquid, right? If you sell your house, then suddenly you may have half a million dollars, but you've got nowhere to live. And then the other piece of it just is that it it's perverse incentives, for lack of a better term. So it's just a drag. As a builder, even though increases in building value is largely what drives the business, it's. I still feel like it's a lousy model. And it's also unfortunate because stability in your life is to own a home because then once you pay it off, there is that potential that you don't have to rent anymore, but then there's still property taxes. There are still costs associated with it. And one of and the major things... And maintenance, absolutely. And one of the major things that oftentimes... Nowadays that I am seeing more and more of is I see a lot of people constantly scrambling because their homes can't, their home insurance dropped them because they're in a flood zone now or they're in a fire zone now where it wasn't before. Yeah, and that's largely obviously being driven by climate change and that's a whole other huge topic. And like you said, mentioning like the curious aspect of housing this quote unquote wealth is that it's only wealth if you can make it liquid. And if it holds its value. And development is a typically, the typical way, the typical cycle of development is some undervalued area suddenly gets more desirable for whatever reason. And then the developers move in and they, and basically they just keep developing until they've overbuilt and people start, they, the projects start going bankrupt. It typically doesn't affect the developer because they're playing with other people money and then they move on to the next thing it's anybody who lives in a city of any size will be consistently amazed at how much power the development community has in their town in terms of local and state politics and also like how much of the building quote-unquote building codes are meant to benefit them rather than specifically homeowners or residents of the said home. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about that. I think maybe the zoning laws, you could certainly make that argument. I got to say, I think building codes typically are useful and have the right things in mind. I think, I don't know if that was always true, but the focus now is really on life safety and quality. Right. I guess maybe I'm thinking about there, there are, so it probably isn't a building code issue, but how much, at least in the United States, climate change has become a culture war issue. And as a result of that, certain states trying to pass certain laws where there's moratorium on solar or wind. Oh, yeah. But those are exactly, but those aren't building code, more zoning issues. And climate climate change, a a large part of our book 
is about the carbon load of construction, the upfront carbon load, um, what it takes to build a house and the trade-offs there. And if it makes sense, the balance between putting a lot of spending essentially a lot of carbon up front to get an energy efficient home versus how much time will it take to, to pay off that carbon debt in terms of reduced energy consumption. The reason I mentioned the building codes is because I've been interested in, I guess, alternative architecture, if you can yeah. call it that. And so I know like people that were wanting to build energy efficient straw bale homes or, or if you want to go more extreme and we've probably as a builder heard or seen about those earthship homes. Yeah, for sure. It's certainly the code is inherently a conservative instrument. Necess not necessarily. Innovation happens very slowly in the building code. And just listening to a lot of people that were wanting to build a lot more energy efficient homes and running into code issues. That's right. why they're just like, ah, it's all about the... Yeah. And know. then there's the whole tiny home movement, which is slowly gaining traction in terms of being permitted. But those, you know, yeah, it's, it's a tough call. Obviously, the point of the building code is to help people build safe houses, to have a minimum level of efficiency and safety. And unfortunately, largely what, the way you do that is things get, buildings have problems and they discover what they are and then it gets incorporated into the building code to avoid them. So it, it's, a, it's not necessarily the best model for moving quickly. And clearly we're headed for a, we're headed into a period of huge changes in the way we live. Yeah, like looking through the book, looking at all the different houses and the very beautiful photos, it's the, one of my questions was going to be about the mental health benefits of these houses, but it's just obvious. <laughs> you look at the houses, you're like, man, right. that would be a nice place to live. Have you seen any sort of specific examples in your time doing this where there has been maybe a subtle or dramatic impact on the people who've built these homes, are they better for That's it? That's an interesting question. I don't know. Certainly people tell, I certainly have clients that I've worked with for a long time who talk about the greater enjoyment they get out of living in their houses. Yeah, it would be tough to quantify that one. I've also, the process of building houses destroyed several marriages as well as working on so <laughs> we, have, yeah, it's yeah. Got we have this program in the UK called Grand Designs, and that's basically the shape of the program, right? It's like a couple who are going to do some ambitious architectural project. They always tend to have a considerable amount of resources behind them and then right. they do it and then it takes longer than they thought it was going to do and there's this one particular episode or episodes actually because they followed it after over like essentially a decade or two and i'll put it, the link in the show notes and i'll pass it on to you because it is oh yeah i'd love to see it phenomenal like what this family actually goes through like where they started and where they end up is kind of jaw-dropping but it is exactly that it's like a huge stressful thing by the oh, looks yeah. of it it looks like the finished product is amazing and it looks like a place that you could quite happily be content in. But I imagine it, it is a, just a fraught experience just to get to that point. Yeah, and the very first thing we talk about in the book is assembling your team. And that's what it is about. You've got the homeowner who has the money and is going to live in this house and it's about their life. And then the, the design team and the build team who have the expertise and hopefully are looking out for the best interests of the clients. And their goal should be to, to build the best house they can for the least amount of money and meet as many of the client's desires as they can. Thoughtful design. I'm not a designer, and it took me a while to appreciate how important good design is. But a lot of what, again, in the book, we talk about the size a lot, that, that these houses are ridiculously large and sterile, and that throwing square feet at a problem, at something that could be better approached through better design, is, is a terrible idea. So I think that a house that's right sized is probably going to be feel more whatever embracing and supportive than a McMansion. One of the books mentioned in your book that I was very fond of is the Not So Big House. Right. I remember buying that book in its follow up when it came out and looking through it. But one of the major things about the trend in American homes is that 
it seems like a uh, homes no longer seem like a place where people necessarily are planning to spend their lives in anymore. I, I think that's t- turning around a little bit, but yes, the average tenure in a U.S. home is pathetically short, well under a decade, which, along with the along with the wealth question, is another perversion. It just leads people to do stupid things. Why care? Why care about problems if you can just patch them up and pass it along to the person you're going to sell to? And God forbid the person that you're selling it to wants to maybe live there for a long time. I think that people are starting to live in houses longer. Again, the average stay, the average length of ownership is still very short. And then then there's the whole question of renters, right? So first of all, construction has gotten very expensive, and I'm not sure of all the reasons, but some of it's actually for a good reason, which is that the trades have typically been pretty crappy for the in their wage scale. It's dangerous, it can be often be unpleasant, and it requires a fair amount of skill, but the pay has been very mediocre. So basically, for the last, whatever, thousand years, poor tradespeople have been subsidizing the lifestyles of rich homeowners. And that's starting to shift just because the labor surge is finally forcing us to raise wages. The downside of that, obviously, is that it's raised the cost of construction quite a bit. Yeah, and so I guess to some degree, like these principles that are demonstrated or outlined in your book, can they apply to less economically resort people with a bunch of money? (laughs) Like so. Definitely. There's this whole field of building science, which is pretty much what our book is based on. The book grew out of something called, we had a local group here in Portland called the Building Science Discussion Group that I moderated for about a decade before COVID hit. And it was a group of builders and designers and other people in the industry who would get together once a month and talk about building science issues, things like insulation and vapor and and water management and all sorts of issues around building homes. And so... The Pretty Good House was one of those discussions. And in the book, we really try to give, it's, as we say in the book, it's not a how-to, it's a why-to. So what we're really trying to do is give people a basic education in building science so that they know the issues that they have to look at if they're building a house. If they can't answer the questions we pose in the book, they need to think about it some more. The building science doesn't change by climate or size or any of these issues. The solutions you come up with will change, but the basic issues of keeping water out, keeping conditioned air in, all of those, that doesn't change. Yeah, and I often like to look through a lot of real estate ads, and I also like to look through a lot of boards where like people are talking about trying to repair their homes or trying to do some like major reconstruction and remodeling, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the major things that I see, especially in, in it's, it's interesting because family size has gone down while square footage of homes have gone up. Yeah. And then that's one, one major trend. Another major trend is that also it seems like the average family does far less entertaining and yet like the homes are more about like entertaining rather than the residents living in it? That certainly can be the case. And that's going back to Sarah Susanka, the, the the not so big house. The I think that was one of her major contributions was to think about what you're going to think about what these rooms are for, right? Like having a dining room that you use on Thanksgiving and the Rosh Hashanah may not be the best use of your space. I rented a what could be called like a starter McMansion at one point. (laughs) And I was renting like it was like me and my mom and then like another family was renting together a home. But it was one of those things where like the there are so many dead spaces in a lot of those homes. I always loved buildings. My love for buildings was always like the really old architecture, right. the castles and the temples and those kinds of things. And that was when I started gaining more of an interest in like architecture that people actually live in. Right. Yeah. McMansions, by definition, are they're not really homes that people are going to love long term. They are 
They're garish, as you said. There's huge amount of waste in space. We call them a, the entryway. We call them the lawyer foyer. Where you walk in the door <laughs> and the ceilings are 30 feet up in the air. Just these huge volumes that need to be built in the first place, heated or cooled in the second place and maintained these absurdly complicated roof lines these random architectural elements slapped up all over the place yeah it's just it's right the there's worst. a blog dedicated to the worst yes. of the McMansions. right yeah kate is a kate's a genius mcmansion hell where does is that impulse that sort of style or design does that start at a particular point in the history of America? Because obviously Britain, a much, much smaller country, (laughs) a tiny little island, like all our houses, barring the sort of over-the-top, opulent, age-old lords, manners, and all that kind of stuff. Most houses are just a bit small, right? Whereas when I've been to America, I'm just like, there's so much space, and these houses are so fucking big. Like, is there a point at which this sort of begins as an, as a thing is it just there's loads of space so we're going to build a huge house or is it like wh- where does it start where did that I don't know for sure but my guess would be that it's mostly coming out of the post world war 2 era when there was a huge push to suburbanize that that developments housing developments grew up all over the place and we've got a pretty good history in this country of large garish places to begin with right there's whatever, what's Hearst Place called, San Simeon. There are all these, that's what you did if you were rich, you built a monstrosity somewhere. So it could be partly just aspirational lifestyle nonsense. Yeah, it's interesting that it's almost like symbolically hollow, though, to live in, right? Yeah, that's certainly my take. I'm sure there are people who love it, but I, I think it's all, yeah, it's a way of, yeah, it's a way of showing something, your wealth, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But clearly it's very destructive on many levels. In the book, you do dedicate a chapter or two to this idea of refurbishment as well as just the new build stuff. Our publisher wants us to write a book about renovation. But what we do talk about in the book is we try to work renovation into each chapter. There is one of our case studies is a renovation. But the problem with renovations, especially where we are in Maine, where we have some of the oldest housing stock in the country, is that it's really hard. It's hard to come up with rules for renovations because every house has a unique set of circumstances that need to be addressed. And the house is presumably in some sort of stasis equilibrium, right? If it's not, it's, it's standing up as it is. And if you start changing things, you have to worry, are you going to cause problems rather than cure them? Like a lot in Maine, a lot of houses have wet basements, which may not be a problem if you're poorly in and you're heating the house all winter and blasting heat through everything, the moisture may not be a big deal. But if you start insulating more, then you're trapping that moisture and you may cause mold or rot problems, for instance. So it requires a level of knowledge and caution. Yeah. And you do outline this stuff about moisture and air quality and all that kind of thing. It's funny, yeah, how much of it maybe I hadn't really truly thought about or considered and obviously covid changed (laughs) my thinking about air quality and i think that's been huge and in fact i think that could be why sort of our publisher wanted us to write this book at that moment we we started writing relatively early in the pandemic and yeah suddenly air quality was a huge issue for everyone and it's been largely unaddressed and the more research we do the more we're discovering the huge health impacts of our indoor air quality Speaking of the culture war, this whole gas stove nonsense, where suddenly gas stoves, which probably a decade ago were thought of as like bourgeois, that the right wing would have said, oh, those are like signs of whatever, postal elite status or something. Now suddenly everybody has, they, they, these same people have an emotional investment in maintaining gas stoves. But we we know that ga- gas stoves are just terrible for indoor air quality. It's just, and it, when you think about it, it's obvious, right? You're burning methane gas inside your house. It's not a big mystery. But anyway, we just keep, the more we look at indoor air quality, the more of an issue we see it is. Even just things like your bedroom, are you getting enough fresh air or CO2 levels building up overnight? Yeah. Right. And it's also just one of the conundrums of homes and climate change is that as 
summers and winters become more destabilized and extreme, the the need for heating and cooling increases. How do you balance out the benefit of ventilation with maintaining comfortable temperature inside the house? Yeah, and we have a whole chapter on mechanical systems. And yeah, there are ways to do it. There's been a great, there are these whole heat recovery vents ventilators that basically intermingle the exhaust and the intake air without them actually physically touching each other, but giving up their heat or their cool to the incoming air so you don't have to so you don't have to condition it from whatever the outside conditions are to what you want it inside. So there, there are problem, it's a problem with the solution. To your point about climate change and all that, the other piece is that we just have this huge housing shortage in this country, right? And we're not really building the kind of housing we need to be building anyway. We just need more multifamily. In Portland, for instance, again, we've got a huge and growing refugee population here. We've got like hundreds of families every night are sleeping in our middle school gym because they've just arrived and there's nowhere to put them. And I just don't see that problem going away anytime soon. I think the refugee, I think whatever, I think we're gonna have hundreds of millions, if not billions of people on the move. And we just, and nobody seems to want to consider what that means, even on the basic level of where are they going to live. And is that, I assume that ultimately the buck stops with the government and public sort of policy and all that kind of stuff. Like to what degree can that stuff be influenced and in what ways Is that important or not important for building sustainable homes in in line with the pretty good house principles? Right. Yeah, it just becomes more and more critical. And there's this whole movement called Passive House. It's a certification that started in Germany. And it really shines in multifamily housing. They're just incredible Passive House projects doing multifamily. And, And to their credit, a lot of more thoughtful developers are actually building that. And that just is, it's got the potential to be transformational. They're much healthier. They're very easy to heat. A multifamily is inherently much more energy efficient because you've got a lot more people living inside of one shell as opposed to all of us living inside of our own shell that needs to be heated and cooled. So there are things happening. The amount of money that's going to be required is just off the charts and and Portland is the biggest city in Maine. It's a dinky city, but it's still the biggest city in Maine. And there are all the usual problems with that where we're the service center and everybody else, the rest of the state doesn't particularly want to contribute to us taking care of our poor people, even though many of them are people who are moving from other parts of the state because there are no services in those parts of the state. These are all, none of these are new problems, but they're, I think they're taking on new urgency just because I think that the numbers are going to be unprecedented. I don't know if either of you the answer to this, and this is a sort of a side, but speaking of uh, people coming into the country, fleeing various kind of uh, situations, what happens in a situation like Ukraine where there are people paying mortgages on flats and houses and then it turns into a war zone? <laughs> are they still liable? Should they be still making monthly payments whilst their home is bombed? What happens in those situations? Right. That's a good question. I don't have an answer to that one, oddly enough. No, I just it just occurred to me because Britain certainly has this culture of if you buy a home, you've somehow made right. it. And I say right. this as a person who doesn't own a home, so I'm obviously bitter. <laughs> I just I was watching when all the new Ukraine stuff was happening, and they were just leveling these towns and cities. I was like, yeah, yeah. If I just got a mortgage, this would be like an extra stress on top of being in a war zone. So I've got to pay my mortgage as well. Yeah, I wonder how that all works. Yeah, it'll be quite an interesting situation after, if if it ever ends. Yeah, Yeah. and I think that's another issue with housing as wealth, right? These people, this was what they owned. Yeah, housing... I think I often think of renters and like being forced out of their apartment and we treat it as like this commercial transaction. But this was these people's home. Even if they didn't own it, it was their home for whatever, a year, 20 years, 50 years, however long they lived there, that was where they lived. And that's where they had their kids or had their celebrations or whatever. And she just treated it as, oh, it's an asset like any other asset. And we trade in our car or whatever. Yeah, it's just, it's not a great way to go. Yeah. And again, linking back to the idea of a home versus a house. And if you had something like a universal basic services, then... 
you know, potentially a home would just be a home. And then you've got that foundation to do whatever you want with your life and you can go trade houses if you want, but <laughs> on a base right. level, you've yeah. always got a home. And to get be- and to get to you guys' area of expertise, a precarity of housing situation is a huge stressor and I'm, and it hits people with mental health issues harder in both senses. In fact, that they're probably more likely to be precarious and it's the precarity is more likely to have a negative impact on them. And it's also in terms of not just mental health, but physical health. It's really difficult to manage medication without oh, yeah. help. Medication right. compliance tends to, you know, tank for very understandable reasons for people without homes. So there are so many aspects of it's just, again, home ownership in the United States and also in you know, almost all developed countries. It's like a huge hallmark of, of stability in many ways. And again, because as Liam was talking about in terms of what happens if you you have a mortgage in a war zone, right? But we know what happens right. to people who have a mortgage in flood zones and fire zones. Right. Or even just if you have a mortgage and you lose your job. It's just, it's, yeah. Right. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, I, again, like that's, I was looking at this message board and just seeing California, almost all of California has become a wildfire zone for right, most of the right. year. No, it's mind-boggling. Oh, and they're yeah. still building, especially, I don't know if it's so true in, Cal- I don't know how true it is in California. Well, I'm sure it's true in California, but it doesn't seem to have, it doesn't seem to have affected Bay Area real estate prices yet, which is incredible because anybody who, you know, anybody who buys a house right now in the Bay Area, it seems like they're insane. The same with Florida. I've known for ages that Florida was going to be underwater, but people keep building crap in Miami. It's just, it's amazing. There are very expensive homes in Miami that flood, that their underground garage floods every day. Yeah, it's this weird exercise in, yeah, willful denial or something. I live in a kind of a suburb of northernmost su- suburb of San Diego County. And on one hand, it is nice that that the homes that are going up are a lot more of the multifamily big condo versus the single family homes in some ways. Right. But again, the major issue being that, like, they're so quickly and shoddily built. Um, and are they even going up in areas that can sustain life at this point? Right. Between the wildfires and the water shortages. Is this an area that people are going to be able to live in 20 or 30 years? That's the that's also one of the major questions, because with climate change, is there like a quote unquote stable area? Yeah, <laughs> because right. Yeah, because it seems like, OK, you've ex- you escaped a fire zone, but now you're living in a hurricane. Zone. Exactly. <laughs> or, or no, it's very hard. It, and resilience is something we talk about a lot in the home building industry these days is what can you do to prepare what can you do to prepare a house for an uncertain future where our where our relatively safe assumptions about climate for the past couple of centuries suddenly are not safe assumptions anymore and definitely like the homes are that are still going up in, in droves are definitely not being built with those concerns in mind. It's another example of, I think, the same thing as my willful denial, right? That that everyone is, everyone is just trying to keep going, pretending that we can keep going. And that's partly because there's no, if there was a genuine effort to say, all right, we know what, we have a rough idea of what's coming, we need to prepare for it. Let's make a plan, but we're not. So the, I'm a as a home builder, I'm I'm at the mercy of whatever clients want to do, right? And what they want to do is largely driven by bigger factors. I can't go. I could advertise a specific thing, but there may not be a market for it. So there's no. There's just no leadership at any level. And the people who could have an impact, like the NAHB, the big National Association of Home Builders, which does a ton of lobbying and stuff, they're on the wrong side of pretty much every issue. As far as this is going, we really, as a friend of mine says, this is the worst moment in human history to put, to be putting carbon into the atmosphere. And yet we just keep doing it and expecting, right. 
even though we know what's going on. Anyway, it's uh, even though I wrote this, even though I co-wrote this book with some vague sense of optimism, I can't say I am terribly optimistic at this moment. Yeah, there's a good little illustration there diagram, Building America Climate Map, where is it on the, it's mostly the West Coast, isn't it, in the marine area, which is has the best slash most stable kind of environment but i guess for how long i don't know <laughs> but yeah it's a good it's a good illustration of and the way that you make the point like depending on what kind of climate you're in surprise surprise that sort of architecture changes to accommodate all these kind of different things but yeah i have a lot of friends who are architects and i never really got the same thing from it that they did but in reading this i was like oh i get it now <laughs> it's, well, it's interesting my three co-authors are all on the design side one of them is a designer and two of them are architects so right, we're heavy right, right. on that stuff and it's just this is our small attempt to do something about it but just imagine if i mean for like these reports about the oil industry companies and then how long ago it was that they had a very good idea of what was going to happen is far back as the 50s that's been coming out recently they had very accurate studies showing what was going to happen imagine if that at that moment we'd said okay we can see what the future looks like if we go down this road let's not and instead basically what they did was bury the evidence and double down on going down that road yeah it's wild isn't it very parallels with the tobacco industry i right. mean i think that's oftentimes what industry does <laughs> yes it's all about perverse incentives. We keep coming back to that. It's all about, yeah. If your job is to if your job is to make money, sharing bad news typically isn't the way to do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. One of the things that I liked about your book was that for the vast majority of people that I come across and I talk to about quote unquote green housing. A lot of it is just most people's idea of green housing is I'm just going to put solar panels on my roof. And, yeah. or, and ultimately, the aspect of the house is not so much of a consideration as much as it's just technology that we are going to utilize. That we can consume our way out of this by... Yes. Use, right. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think that the two, the two biggest lessons, I think the two biggest lessons hopefully are the best house, the most environmentally responsible house is the one you don't build. So either buy an existing house and renovate it or stay where you are or whatever. And, and the other thing is that size is just a huge issue right the smaller the just the smaller and simpler the shape the better on every level right. if you were trying to give advice to somebody who is considering one buying a home and being conscious about environmental issues what would be some of your basic advice for them man that's a tough one again size Look for adaptability. Can the house can the house change over time as your needs change? Location is really important, or it's what you can have a very you can have a very environmentally responsible house, but if you have to drive thirty miles every day to get to work or the supermarket or whatever, then that's obviously a big problem. So I guess those would be my big ones. Okay, so location and size by an existing yeah. house rather other than new construction, and those would be like right. the three starters. Yeah, and gather data. First of all, home ownership is expensive, so be prepared to spend money. And then there are there is data that you can get. A client may not, a person selling it may not want to share it, but looking at past utility bills is a pretty good indicator of the energy efficiency of the home. If, and if things like if you're aware of things like siting or do you get decent southern exposure if you're in a cold climate all of that kind of stuff can certainly help inform it i guess my advice would be read our book smart absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah i've also read elsewhere like some people like parking up in the neighborhood for a couple of nights to see what it's like is it really loud at night yeah. and all that kind of stuff and yeah right that and can seems... you walk? Are there people out on the streets walking or is everybody locked up in their house at night and it's not a particularly inviting environment? Yeah, that the house changing over time or adapting to maybe your changing lifestyle. The first thing that sprung to mind was certainly 
elderly people getting stair lifts and all that kind of stuff. Right. right. Are, there, are there more examples along those lines? Is it- if we're building a new house, we certainly try to think about can you can somebody live on the first floor if they need to? So either there's a full bath already or there's like a closet that could be converted into a shower, something like that. So that's one one area. We think about things like kitchen layout. There's a whole field called aging in place, which is all about that. And even aging in place is a misnomer because you could whatever, you could have a temporary disability, you could break your leg or something like that, mm-hmm. or you could have a permanent disability. So these are issues that can affect anybody, but clearly the most you know, predictable course is that your mobility gets worse as you get older. So yeah, those are certainly some of the things that we, we try to think about when we're designing new or even when we're renovating. But I, I'd say the first barrier, low barrier, low barrier living, I guess, is what encompasses most of it. And again, flexibility, right? Like sometimes we don't do it that often, but you could do, sometimes we've done kitchens with counters at various heights, which is just me. That could be for somebody who's in a wheelchair or it could just be for tall people and short people can both use the kitchen. Yeah. I'm four foot 10, so I'm constantly. <laughs> yeah, and I'm the every, other end of the spectrum in the middle, six foot two. And every sink I've ever used when I've washed up has been way too low. Right. Yeah, so we have these we have these standards, but they're built to serve the mean or the average person, right? But how many of us actually, how many have actually live in that space? So anyway, but you obviously don't want to get too particular because hopefully you're not going to be the only people ever to live in this house. But there's got to be some flexibility. There's a great book called How Buildings Learn by Stuart Brand, who's a somewhat controversial figure in other ways. But I really love that book in particular. And it talks about it talks about a lot of these issues, right? Sort of the unplanned ways that buildings change over time and then the planned ways that they can change. It's a fun read if you have an interest in the subject. Yeah, one of the things that oh, go ahead. No, it's just I will look up that book. All the things that we've mentioned, I'll put in the show notes as well. Right. Yes. One of the trends that I've noticed in homes was over time, like going from childhood to this point in my life now of like the explosion of number of bathrooms in homes. Especially the McMansions. Because it used to be just, okay, four-bedroom house back when I was a child. Like, it was pretty common for, say, a three- to four-bedroom house, which was probably the size of most of a good chunk of my friends, right, were living in three- to four-bedroom homes. And it was pretty common for those homes to have only one, one bathroom. Or a full bath or a full bath on the second floor and a half bath on the first. Yes. And now, like, it's common for, I see, again, like, I look at these real estate listings out of just fun and curiosity on a regular basis. And now it's common for bathrooms to outpace the number of bedrooms. Wow. Yeah. So much of this is just wasted space. Again, it's just how often do these bathrooms get used and even how right. often do the bedrooms get used? Right. One of my questions when I'm first meeting with a client and we're talking about either a renovation or a new house is, is to talk about lifestyle. Like, I, I don't know about you guys, but I spend probably 10 minutes a day awake in my bedroom, right? I get into bed, I read for a few minutes, I fall asleep, I get up in the morning and I go get dressed and that's it. But other people love to sit in their bedroom in a chair and read or something so there's nothing right or wrong but if you're not the kind of person who's you know if you're the kind of person like me you obviously don't need the same bedroom as the other kind of person and it's also having lived in like other countries it does give you a sense of how space is used differently in cultures right right i think the other thing in the u.s is stuff too right there's the whole stuff question i think a lot of what we a lot of what our houses are is basically warehouses for stuff yeah, no, the, there is definitely Japan being a very small island with very limited space. And having lived in Japanese homes when I was younger, I was it, one of the first things that I noticed about moving to the United States was like a very different relationship to space and very different use of space, especially when I bring up the bathroom question, because this whole idea of the toilet, the sink and the bath being a single room doesn't exist in Japan. Huh. These things are all separated out and that allows more people to use. That so makes like, sense. It's very common for you have a very small toilet with a sink 
And that's one space, right? And then you have a bath and the Japanese bath is like a tub and then a tiled area outside the tub where you can shower because generally speaking, you want to rinse off before you get into the bath water, culturally speaking. And then there's a separate place that's usually right next to the bath, but the bath area is its own kind of section. And then there's a separate area where there's the sink and usually washing machines. Mm. So it's like a sink area and washing machine. Usually the reason why the washing machines are right next to the bath is because it's very common to recycle the bath water in your laundry. That's great. Yeah, so yeah you- I think that there's a lot of, right, some things we do just because we've always, we do them because we do them. There's, it's this, whatever, it's like a, it's not quite a cliche, but it's like, all right, that's what we expect to see and it looks funny if not, but not because there's any logical reason. Like, one of the things I know that the toilet paper shortage early in the pandemic did was suddenly make bidets popular in a way. I think that they thought, they were thought of as Frenchified affectations. Right. The days are like ubiquitous in Japan. Yeah. I got yeah. one during COVID. It's great. Yeah. Especially the Toto the super fancy bidets that talk back to you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's yeah. The Japanese. Japanese toilets are the best. I've heard a lot of Americans move to Japan for work reasons. And they were like, oh, yeah, those bathrooms are great because so many people can use them. You don't need everything in one space. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You need fresh perspective. You need somebody to come back from Japan and say, hey, this is when we try this. Or come back from wherever and say, hey, here's a clever idea that we never do in the U.S. Because in terms of a not so big house concept, right? If if you are thinking about using less square footage, then, you know, a lot of what European countries do, a lot of what Japanese and, and Asian countries do in terms of how they think about space is very much about that because those are often areas with not so much space to begin with. Uh, And multifunctionality is very important. And even how you heat and cool, like I I don't, I've read, I don't know from obviously, maybe you can tell us, Ikoi, but you know that typically Japanese homes are kept pretty cold and the room you're in, you turn the heat on in that room. Yeah. Yeah. Like this idea of heating an entire home. Again, also like electricity and all these resources have been a lot more expensive in those countries than the United States. And like heating and cooling an entire home was un- is still, unless you're extremely wealthy, it's still not common practice. So it's interesting how, back to carbon, how much cheap energy has affected how we build houses in this country. Oh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just the like you said, the amount of just wasted, wasted ceiling space. (laughs) And then those ceiling spaces often having these like big, huge windows. Right. 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 Yeah. There there's a lot of architectural things that like absolutely make no sense in the United States. And again, like McMansion and McMansion Hell is the website is a really great place where you see a lot of the examples of that. You know, one of the things about like American architecture is that especially the McMansions are an example of a really strange and incoherent combination of various architectures. I often joke that the design software they use must have architectural randomizers on them. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's anything, Equi's question about what someone could do if they were thinking about buying a house. Do you think there is anything anyone can do in a rental property? Because obviously you can't really change anything. I don't know. What Do you just get an air purifier and cross your fingers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, so one thing is just to find out what's going on. There are... There are better and cheaper air quality monitors than ever before. In fact, right now I'm looking at one that I have in my office. It's by a company called AWAIR, A-W-A-I-R, and it measures CO2 
VOCs, small particulate matter, uh, and humidity levels. And that and it keeps track of them so you can see over you can it's an app and you can look on your phone for what the trends are over time. So even just knowing that is huge. Yeah, there are air purifiers that are relatively you can even make your own. There's something called a Corsi Rosenthal box that people came up right. with. Uh, so, there's yes. been even modifications to that right. to make it more costly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And there are cheap things you can do, like storm windows. Like they, you can make your own storm windows out of basically strips of wood and plastic. Like these interior storm windows with foam around the edges, and they're hugely effective in, ter- in, in terms of keeping keeping it cooler or warmer. So yeah, there are definitely things you can do. Um, Brilliant. That that will help. Yeah, we've hit the hour. Unless, is there anything you feel like maybe we haven't touched on or haven't covered? The o- the only thing I have to say is I was listening to your interview with Chuck and the natural gas being euphemism or the marketing right. term for methane. Right? Yeah, we didn't talk about the whole electrify everything movement. But yeah, uh, fossil fuels are obviously killing us. Uh, and anything we can do to reduce or eliminate them is valuable. What is the ele- what, is that a thing in the states? I don't. I haven't heard that term. Electrify everything. Is that a th- yeah? It's a shorthand for right getting rid of oil fired boilers or gas fired appliances. Yeah, getting your gas range out of your house. That kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, because in the U.S. most yeah, in the U.S. typically heating equipment has been oil or gas fired. Oh, and I will also just mention that we do have a website that people can check out. It's just prettygoodhouse.org. Massive thank you as always to our VIP patrons, Rebecca Johns, Bruce Rogers Vaughan, Alexander Lashley, Sheena Belmus, Seamus O'Connell, Alex Placito, Alexandra McCormick, Wig Shaker, Elizabeth McKechnie, J. Daniel Richer, Fontaine, and Sean Venado. By the way, listeners, if you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolf and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. And if you want to hear even more from Harriet, check out her radio show, Into personal update on WBAI and in the WBAI archives.